Rodriguez. She is currently a PhD candidate at Royal Holloway uh, University of London. Uh, and her research, uh, sorry, it's just my biography just disappeared. There we go. Sorry, her research focuses on the diverse artistic networks formed by women who contributed to the initial stage of the pre-Raphaelite movement, not only as artists, but also as writers, patrons, models, and art critics. She aims to explore the extent to which their participation reveals a collective artistic identity and how their gendered contributions affected the artist, uh, artistic direction of the pre raphaelite label. Katia is currently uh, the Legacy Officer and Dissertation Prize Coordinator at the Association for Art History's Doctoral and Early Career Research Committee and is also the newsletter editor for the Women's History Network. So Katia, if you're ready to begin, um, I'll hand over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Maddie and Freya, for uh, having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, we can. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so my paper today focuses on a group of women who commissioned pre-Raphaelite works in the first few decades of the movement, so from around 1848 to 1870. I started researching pre-Raphaelite patronage as part of my ongoing PhD research, which focuses on the collectives of women who became part of the pre-Raphaelite network during this initial period of the movement, um, and through various artistic practices, not only as artists, but as writers, models, and as I wanted to explore, patrons. Whilst there have been references to pre-Raphaelite women patrons in the scholarship, the most substantial being um, Diane McLeod's chapter titled Pre-Raphaelite Women Collectors and the Female Gaze in an edited collection called Collecting the Pre-Raphaelites, they are often merely referred to as the wife of a pre-Raphaelite patron, or their practices are briefly summarized in a paragraph or in a footnote. As an attempt to address this scholarly gap, this paper serves to initiate a conversation that places these women in the center of pre-Raphaelite patronage. Before we delve into these women's practices, I want to clarify what I consider here as pre-Raphaelite art collecting. This paper focuses on direct commissions by women, excluding portrait commissions, donations by the artist, and inheritance of works previously owned by male patrons. Although these art collecting paths are worth investigating, my intention is to examine the particular commissions which encourage the early pre-Raphaelite iconography and which can reveal the connection between the works and those who display a commitment to financially support these aesthetics. I also wanted to provide an additional note on the dates and artists mentioned. My focus on this exact period is due to my aim of exploring why and how women became involved with an artistic movement that was relatively recent. Furthermore, the pre-Raphaelite aesthetics begin to diverge from the original aims in around 1860s, making this a turning point in the movement. As I began exploring pre-Raphaelite women patrons, it became clear that most of their direct commissions happened between these dates, 1850 to late 1860s. My goal is thus not to disregard their later commissions by women, but rather to focus on what happened during this period that made pre-Raphaelite art so appealing to this group of women. Overall, my aim is to demonstrate how their gendered artistic consumption demonstrates a shared interest in investing in art that reflects their own homoerotic and homosocial interests, and how this female-centered investment relates to other modes of mutual influence and networking developed in the pre-Raphaelite circle. So who were these women? Before we begin exploring their motivations, I would like to give you an overview of who they were and how they became involved in pre-Raphaelite patronage, so we can situate their art collecting experiences in their lives. Our first woman is Ellen Heaton. Born in 1816, she came from a middle class background as her mother was a descent of farmers and her father a bookseller. She was deeply religious, born into the Church of England due to her father's devotion, and throughout her life became involved in multiple philanthropic object projects. Heaton's more exuberant life began after she inherited shares and property from her father's death. She traveled with her partner Fanny Haworth, and through her she became acquainted with Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning in Italy. 
It was then through the Browning's cultural circle that she met John Ruskin, who became a sort of mentor in her Puraflight patronage. The correspondence between Ruskin and Heaton conveys the idea that her commissions had a potential mission of helping the artists due to the frequent, frequent uh, emphasis on the idea of helping the artist's commission as displayed now on the screen. This would then lead us to consider whether her artistic patronage was somewhat linked to her interest in charity work, which she also performed throughout her life. Her interest in the paraphilites was not approved by her brother, John, who at first criticized the artistic movement, specifically the works of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the artist um, Ellen Heaton commissioned the most. However, he later changed his mind and with his wife, who was also called Ellen, Ellen Morsley, later also Ellen Heaton, he commissioned some works, inclu including portraits of the family. Ellen Heaton's, uh, the sister, commissions of Rossetti included um, Dante's vision of Rachel and Leah, displaying a scene from Dante Alighieri's Purgatorio, where Dante encounters the sisters Rachel and Leah, who symbolize respectively contemplation and activity. Another Dantean scene titled Dante's Dream at the Time of Death of Beatrice. This watercolor version of uh, Joan of Arc, a woman who sacrificed herself to lead the French army as a display of devotion and subservience to God and how Sir Galahad, Sir Boris, and Sir Percival were fed with the same grail, but Sir Percival's sister died by the way, which I will shorten from now on to our Sir Galahad because it's a really long title, um, where there are two narratives within one frame, one relating to how the knights were rewarded with the same grail, and another one relating to Percival's sister lying dead on the floor, who played a crucial role in the knight's journey as she sacrificed her life to heal a woman with leprosy that could only be saved, according to the prophecy, by the blood of a virgin. Although Heaton relied um, on Ruskin's expertise, she remained faithful to her own opinions and values, as illustrated by her refusal to purchase Edward Burne Jones' Sidonia von Bork. This watercolor portrays Sidonia, the protagonist of uh, Wilhelm Meinhold's Gothic romance, uh, Sidonia the Sorceress, a woman of 16th century Pomerania who was executed for witchcraft. After Ruskin suggested she, she uh, purchase it, Heaton refused to buy it, leaving Ruskin apologizing for his suggestion, as shown now on the slide. For Heaton, the problem with this painting was the figure portrayed. As a 19th century woman shaped by the ethics and religious values of her society, the immorality of Sidonia would collide with Heaton's own beliefs. Indeed, the subject in this painting poses a contrast to the scenes depicted in the works commissioned by Heaton. The ref this refusal makes it clear that something that unites those species in Heaton's collection is a shared ideal of self-sacrifice and morality. This is further demonstrated by her commissions of other works by Rossetti alluding to biblical scenes, such as Bethlehem Gate, of which I don't have a reproduction to show you, which represents the biblical narrative of the massacre of the innocents as an angel guides the Holy Family to the outside of Bethlehem. And this work, uh, Mary in the House of St. John, showing Mary and John awaiting Christ's resurrection after the crucifixion. This work is particularly interesting to consider here because Heaton was not the only woman interested in buying this work. Although this was initially planned for Heaton, Lady Pauline Trevelyan demonstrated an interest in buying it as soon as she came to hear of it. Rossetti then changed the initial plans of or this watercolor to first attend the demands of Lady Trevelyan. The almost collaborative context of the submissions of this work are further reflected in the scene portrayed. Mary and John are depicted collaborating to light up a lamp, a symbol of Christ's resurrection, as John strikes a flint and Mary fills the lamp with oil. This work represents thus an act of collaboration within a religious context and alludes to the need of a unified and synchronized practice to display devotion. There is thus an, an emphasis on collectivism over individualism in both the depiction and in the practices of the collectors. Lady Trevelyan was also born in 1816 and her mother was of Huguenot descent and her father a reverend. Similar to Heaton, uh, Trevelyan was also exposed to the Church of England's doctrine from an early stage. 
Additionally, her correspondence reveals her personal and familial sympathy towards the Oxford movement, particularly regarding Edward Bizet, a key figure for the movement who became her brother-in-law. Along her husband, Walter Trevelyan, she traveled, collected art, and engaged in charity. She was one of the first to encourage Ruskin, one of her closest friends, to support the Pre-Raphaelites when the group became public. She further evidenced her encouragement of the movement by writing a review of Ruskin's pamphlet Pre-Raphaelitism, where she points to, quote, the training of academies, the shallow criticisms, the unenlightened patronage of those who purchase pictures as the causes of the fault in the system that led the, led the Pre-Raphaelites to emerge. Through her patronage of the Paraphalites, she then became part of a network which practiced a new category of enlightened patronage, um, clearly intended to right this wrong. She combined this art collecting mission with the decoration of the Wallington Hall estate, as she commissioned William Bell Scott and Arthur Hughes to paint murals, which she also painted herself, and the Paraphalite sculptor Thomas Woolner to produce this artwork depicting a woman teaching a child how to pray, as the title describes. But Mary in the House of St. John was not the only work to be replicated among women patrons. Another version of Joan of Arc, bought by Heaton, was also commissioned by Lady Louisa Ashburton. Lady Ashburton was born in 1827. She came from aristocratic lineage and she too had personal and social connections to the Church of England, as her closest networks of friends included religious figures such as bishops, priests, and Lady Trevelyan herself, as both developed an intimate and enduring friendship. Lady Ashburton married Baron William Baring, uh, they had a daughter, and he died in 1864. Already a wealthy aristocrat, his death left her with further abundance of material possessions and wealth, which she used for art patronage. In the late 1860s, she began a relationship with the American sculptor Harriet Hosmer, whose works she also commissioned. Lady Ashburton's later years were dedicated to charity causes. Another woman who became involved in commissioning art after becoming a widow was Harriet Baring, the Marchioness of Bath. She was born in 1802 into a family with aristocratic links. Her involvement with the Paraphalite group is due to Rossetti's aunt Charlotte Polidori, who was a maid at the Marchioness house and who introduced the Marchioness to the works of Rossetti, which then led her to commission the girlhood of Mary Virgin. After purchasing it, the Marchioness gifted the work to her daughter, Louisa Fielding. We will come back to this work, but the chosen subject for this painting, a moment in Virgin Mary's, uh, Mary's uh, youth, seems to further encourage the view that there was a tendency among these women to favor religious subjects. The work so far can be divided in three subcategories, all related to religion and devotion. We have biblical scenes and figures such as Mary in the House of St. John, Bethlehem Gate, the girlhood of Mary Virgin. We have self-sacrificial and religiously devoted figures such as Joan of Arc and House Sir Galahad, where the figures endure journeys and battles with the aim of achieving God and salvation. And then Woolner's sculpture where a woman is leading the word of God by being the one to devote her time to teach it. And then we have spiritual realms, like in Dante's dream at the time of death of Beatrice and Dante's vision of Rachel and Leah, which allude to the idea of the ethereal realm as ideal for communicating messages. That is, Dante's encounters are possible through dreams and visions, with Beatrice as an angel-like figure guiding the poet through his, this ethereal domain. This connection between material possessions and religious meaning is a reflection of their wider context. As explored by scholars such as Deborah Cohen in Household Gods, the British and their possessions, the financial prosperity and subsequent higher consumption power of the middle classes, which was enabled by the Industrial Revolution, meant that sin was perceived to be more present in everyday life. As a result, the Victorians attributed moral qualities to the material possessions as a way of aligning the increasing financial prosperity and subsequent consumption power with their religious duties. This emphasis on the morality of objects also became embedded within religious practices. For instance, the Oxford movement or Tractarianism 
defended the idea of material phenomena as types of real things and seeing, thereby emphasizing the need to interact with material to achieve spiritual truth and meaning. The Tractarians defended thus an active pursuit of devotion, which involved engagement with and interpretation of objects. This need for active interpretation is illustrated, for instance, in Dante's dream at the time of death of Beatrice and in Dante's vision of Rachel and Leah. As we've seen, these are reminiscent of divine messages being conveyed through these visions and apparitions. It emphasizes the need to look beyond the material world, to thoroughly interpret one's vision beyond the surface, to find true spiritual meaning. The idea that the women's experiences in patronage are aligned with their experiences with religion leads us to consider the extent to which patronage became a form of philanthropy for these women. The Christian practice of charity was normatively a feminine activity. Through charity, women could perform normative feminine duties such as nurture, care, religious devotion, while still engaging with social causes of their interest. Whilst there is limited evidence to suggest that their patronage was fully motivated by a desire to perform charity work, the Christian philanthropic elements in the women collectors' experiences demonstrate their willingness to become art patrons was linked to a concern with maintaining morality and benevolence in their artistic consuming habits. Considering women working in charity tended to focus on gendered causes such as pregnancies, children, servants, fallen women, Choosing art patronage seems to challenge the norm. However, considering that spirituality and religion seem to be at the core of these women's commissions, patronage is here still linked to the social expectations of them as women, given the strong correlation between womanhood and morality and spirituality. The religious and spiritual subjects they commission reflect this connection between womanhood and religion, as women seem to be at the center of the devotional scenes. That is, Joan of Arc, Mary, Percival's sister, Beatrice, and the woman teaching the child how to pray take crucial roles in guiding or working with others to navigate through spiritual and devotional journeys. This shared interest in female groups within philanthropy is further demonstrated in a charity project where Heaton and Lady Trevelyan collaborated. In the late 1850s to um, 1860s, they worked together to promote the work of lace makers in the south of England, which also extended to include Christina Rossetti as a buyer and exchanger of the products. While Lady Trevelyan worked with lace makers to develop their technique, Heaton took a promotional role and Christina Rossetti bought and sold lace collars for herself and other pre-Raphaelite associates such as William Bell Scott. This interest in female community, communities was also part of a wider social and religious concern with sisterhoods, which led to the rise in female religious communities in this period. The Oxford movement advocated for the establishment of religious communities and sororities, such as the Sisterhood of the Holy Cross created in London in 1845, began to emerge. The concept of a religious sisterhood provides a paradoxical definition of agency. On the one hand, there is the possibility that sisterhoods control women by managing and limiting their accessibility to external ideas and possessions, as posed by Linda Palazzo. Whilst this passivity in accepting an imposed sacrifice might allude to a loss of agency, viewing their self-sacrifice as a religious perspective on collaboration is in fact indicative of power. As a subject who willingly sacrificed himself for his followers, Christ as a symbol can be found through a sacrificial act. Furthermore, the nun's self-sacrifice is achieved through a collective commitment to self-sacrifice, as each woman belongs to a religious network devoted to the same values. Therefore, the passive nature of sisterhoods does not always equate to a limitation upon female agency, as they further challenge the dominantly patriarchal structure by serving as a network for women to collectively share and connect through their spiritual devotion. Before bringing this back to the Women's Art Commission specifically, I would like to address how this idea of a woman's network within religion is further present within the Pereflite circle. Christina Rossetti, a figure who, as we've seen, worked closely with some of these women patrons, 
also shared the Oxford movement's concern with community building for the purpose of religious education in the form of sisterhoods. She displayed an interest in women's causes through her work at St. Mary Magdalene's, a house for fallen women. This concern with the female collective is also present in her works. In a poem, Goblin Market, for instance, this focus on a female collective is demonstrated by the celebration of sisterly love and of self-sacrificial acts for the benefit of a female community. When Laura, one of the sisters in the poem, um, cannot resist the temptation of the goblin's fruit um, and exchanges a piece of her hair for the fruits, her sister Lizzie reminds her of the tale of Jeannie, who was also temp tempted by the goblins and unable to find the goblins again to satisfy her intense thirst for more fruits, died. Her story now serves as a tale to inform women what not to do when encountering the goblins, which turns her into a self-sacrificial figure for the education of the female community. Although Lizzie understands the moral meaning of Jeannie's story, Laura does not, and so her story becomes very similar to Jeannie's. Laura begins to suffer from the same incessant thirst and is unable to find the goblins. As a self-sacrifice, Lizzie meets the goblins herself to buy fruits for Laura, but the goblins, angry that Lizzie does not want to ingest the fruits with them, proceed to abuse her physically and verbally. When she comes home, drenched with juice from the goblin's fruits, Laura drinks these juices from Lizzie's body and both become healed. In addition to both sisters displaying here an act of devotion and self-sacrifice for each other, the end of the poem refers that their own story will be told as an example for their children and future generations. Like Jeannie's, Laura and Lizzie's story becomes an instructive tale for future women. Therefore, and due to the emphasis on the collective effort, Christina's works, views, and context change, challenge the idea that influence is a male direct pro process. As a contrast, Dante Rossetti's poetry embodies this vision of ideas as to be passed down linearly by emphasizing the influence of a previous male generation on his works. The poem Dante's Tenebrae exemplifies this mode of influence by highlighting how the works of, a Dante, of Dante Alighieri influence Rossetti's father, who was a Dante Alighieri scholar, who in turn transferred this Dantean legacy to his son. Contrarily, Christina's view of sisterhoods in both her activities and in Goblin Market demonstrate that a gendered presence in these exchanges of ideas challenges this model by implementing a network where self-sacrificed members share ideas among themselves. Challenging patrilineality through self-sacrifice and commitment to female collectives as displayed in Goblin Market is also present in the women patrons practices. Through their purchase, the women disrupt the lineal mode of influence exemplified by Dante Rossetti by literally taking these artistic works and their subjects and making them their own. By becoming owners of these works, the women then shift the meaning of the works from the male artist's perspective to their own subjectivity. In this particular paternal circle, we thus witness the women's individual motivations for patronage become part of a collective, thereby unifying the women and contributing to a shared identity as patrons. Further to the common interest in religious depictions and to the philanthropic elements in their commissions, this shared identity is strengthened by the ownership of artistic works that place and celebrate the women at the forefront of these religious experiences. For instance, Keaton also purchased two watercolors by Arthur Hughes, Aurora Lee's Dismissal of Romney, and that was a Piedmontese, based on Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poems um, Aurora Lee and A Court Lady, respectively. Keaton was not, however, entirely satisfied with them. In her opinion, the faults in the works included the lack of expression in the women's faces and the colors of the dresses. However, both watercolors remain in her possession. Keaton's relationship with Elizabeth Barrett Browning may have influenced this. Although Elizabeth Browning conveyed some impatience towards Heaton's eccentric and enthusiastic personality at the beginning of their relationship, pointing out specifically Heaton's incessant restless talking, it developed into a friendship. This led to Heaton commissioning the two portraits of Robert and Elizabeth Browning, now at the National Portrait Gallery, as a gift to her friends. 
As the scholar Martha Vicinus explains, a friendship between two women could be more important than a heterosexual sexual love because it was considered less sexually driven and more self-sacrificing. As her admirer and friend, Heaton's wish to commemorate her works could have been translated into supporting artistic forms that promoted Browning's poetry. In this case, self-sacrificing her own judgments would thus be a display of commitment to supporting the influence of not only a friend, but a woman with cultural and literary power. Heaton and Lady Trevelyan's shared interest in Mary in the House of St. John is also interesting to reconsider in light of self-sacrifice for the celebration of female agency. On the one hand, both women were not only acquainted with each other, but also part of the same social network surrounding the Pre-Raphaelites. It is thus likely that Rossetti's change of plans to first attend to Lady Trevelyan's commission was not seen by Heaton as a competition with a rival patron. Self-sacrifice is not, however, limited to the context of the works commissions, as the watercolor also reflects the need for both devotion and collaboration in a religious context, as briefly mentioned. Conveyed by the wooden cross framing the window behind Mary and John, God's own sacrifice is the central focus of the image and also what connects the two figures portrayed. After the crucifixion and as night and darkness arrive, Mary and John wait for Christ to resurrect. This wait, however, is neither isolated nor inert as both figures work actively and together to demonstrate their service to God. This is in line with the idea of collective self-sacrifice as collaboration, as the figures work together, and as agency. John's obedience to God is conveyed through his writing materials, through which he proactively serves Christ by writing the gospel, and Mary's figure is a reminder that her constant presence as a follower of God, from the moment of the inception of Christ to powerlessly witnessing his death, is what grants her agency. Considering Heaton's and Trevelyan's individual concerns with collaborations and self-sacrifice, both through Pre-Raphaelite patronage and through their mutual interest in endorsing female collectives of lace makers, their shared interest in owning this particular depiction can, can be viewed as further evidence of how they both promoted female agency. Similarly, the Marchioness of Bath purchased the girlhood of Mary Virgin in the context of a female community, as Rossetti's Aunt Charlotte was instrumental to the sale of the painting. The future of the painting as a gift to the buyer's daughter is also illustrative of how the women's network changes, challenges uh, the linear process. Instead, we witness a matri non-linear web become the core of these exchanges, which ultimately contributes to our understanding of women patrons as a shared collective, rather than the effect of an isolated linear process of influence. In this case, the concern with collaboration also transpires in the iconography of the work purchase. Firstly, the mother and daughter relationship behind the purchase of the work is reflected in the scene portrayed as the work represents Mary and her mother in collaboration. Christina Rossetti and her mother were also involved in the production of the painting as they modeled for Mary and the mother respectively. Secondly, the typological nature of the work is aligned with, with the idea of religious symbolism as an enabler of the women's agency, which in this case extends to the manifestation of a female exclusive relationship. While Christ's self-sacrifice is present through the dove, thorns and the vine framing the upper part of the painting, the work does not discard the women's own self-sacrifice. The angel childlike figure on the left side of the canvas facing Mary foreshadows the moment the angel Gabriel announces how she will fully devote herself as mother of Christ. The presence of self-sacrifice and collaboration is not limited, however, to the women's display of, of female-led and collaborative relationships within their patronage practices. Another aspect contemporary and related to some of the women here considered and which emerges in their patronage is the um, Anglo-American expatriate community in Italy in the mid 19th century. As explored by Alison Chapman in Networking the Nation, British and American Women's Poetry in Italy, a group of women linked to artistic and literary practices found in Italian cities such as Florence and Rome, a culturally rich and, and politically liberal space 
where they could more freely demonstrate their literary and cultural agency. Firstly, Italy was appealing to artists who benefited from cheaper art materials and um, workspaces and apprenticeship opportunities. In addition, the political state of Italy as, quote, a locus for a pro-unification politics that was attractive to many foreign liberals, as Chapman put it, allow women in particular to more freely manifest their own political and social views. As a result, Italy offered a range of erotic and romantic possibilities which would not be as liberally available in their own cities. Among the women who found in Italy a way to conduct their liberated relationships were Heaton and Lady Ashburton. The relationship between Heaton and Haworth was described by Elizabeth Barrett Browning as a matrimonial partnership. She writes in January 1859 that Miss Haworth and Miss Heaton in their new marital state and its honeymoon still have arrived in, in Rome. A month later, she similarly writes that Fanny Haworth is here in the honeymoon of her matrimonial alliance with Ellen Heaton. On the other hand, Lady Ashburton began a romantic relationship with Harriet Hosmer in the 1860s, while the two were in Rome. And the surviving letters between Ashburton and Hosmer are revealing of the passionate sexual nature of their connection. While they had both been in relationships with other women prior to becoming involved with each other, their relationship was the most enduring and mature, as Martha Vicinus adds, they had. Both Heaton and Lady Ashburton, the two women who found in Italy a space to freely pursue homoerotic and romantic relationships, were the ones who, within this collective of female patrons, displayed a particular inclination to Italian-inspired subjects in their commissions. As mentioned, Heaton purchased the Dantian subjects of Rachel and Leah and at the time of death of Beatrice. Besides the focus on the ethereal domains of dreams and visions, these works are particularly interesting to consider in the context of her domestic partnership with Haworth because both follow the actions of female figures. The focus of both watercolors is on the women portrayed. Through the placing of Rachel and Leah in the center of the canvas and through the positioning of the figures framing um, Beatrice, leading the eye of the viewer to the central point, the woman of the work. Furthermore, the work salutes to romantic or heterosexual relationships. In Dante's dream at the time of death of Beatrice, Dante uses the spiritual realm to re-encounter his love, which could not happen on earth. The only Dantian depiction purchased by Lady Ashburton, Rossetti's The Meeting of Dante and Beatrice in Paradise, similarly alludes to the idea of an encounter which could not occur on the earthly realm, but which is possible in the spiritual domain. While this work's whereabouts is unknown and there is no reproduction available, the title suggests a scene where Dante and Beatrice meet in a heavenly place that enables their re-encounter. This can be read in parallel to Heaton's and Ashburton's relationships, which formed and developed in Italy, but which would not be as liberally regarded in England. These Dantian scenes are thus used to convey the displacement of relationships. Heaton's and Ashburton's relationships become displaced in England, similar to Dante and Beatrice's impossible encounters on Earth, but Italy, like the heavenly realm, becomes a welcoming and enabling space for them. Similarly elusive to same-sex desire is the representation of Rachel and Leah. Although, to cite Martha Vicinus, there is little evidence that metaphors of sisterly love were commonly used to regard something deeper than an equal friendship, there is the possibility that it provided an appropriate representation of an egalitarian relationship within a challenging, moral-driven society. Furthermore, eroticized sisterly love is also explored in homoerotic readings of Goblin Market, a text which, as we've seen, has some parallels to the practices here explored. Scholars should, such as uh, Dorothy Merman have examined the sexual nature of the fruits exchange in the poem, thereby contributing to the analysis of sororal love in parallel with eroticism. These homoerotic elements lead us to consider the idea of self-sacrifice in the context of same-sex relationships. 
While I've attempted to explore this in relation to homosocial and familial relations, Heaton's and Lady Ashburton's experiences in patronage are also pertinent to further review the role of devotion and sacrifice in a homoerotic context. Indeed, both women own a version of uh, Rossetti's Joan of Arc, a figure who embodies the urgency to actively manifest devotion and self-sacrifice for the benefit of a collective, as she showed her subservience to God by proactively leading the army. The watercolors convey a representation of Joan steadily holding the sword while looking up to the motivation behind this sacrifice, God. The idea of a Joan adopting a normatively masculine position as a knight is comparable to the women engaging in same-sex relationships. That is, um, Heaton and Ashburton disrupt heteronormative structures by engaging in a female exclusive dynamic, similar to Joan of Arc, who places herself in a position of religious power, which was, in her context, reserved for men. This leads to the last point, which concerns the religious nature of this disruption. As Joan of Arc sacrifices herself in the name of God, Heaton and Ashburton are, to some extent, identifying themselves with someone whose self-sacrifice occurs with the aim of achieving salvation. Although the gendered nature of self-sacrifice emphasizes the point that women use the feminine trait of passivity to display agency, the adoption of a masculine position requires us to review how the latter affects the self-sacrificing identity. That is, to what extent is the display of agency through self-sacrifice and passivity replaced by the display of agency through the adoption of a masculine identity? The point can be made that the presence of a masculine position does not overshadow the feminine. Instead, the masculine trait contributes to our understanding of gendered agency. Similar to how the Dantian scenes allude to the displacement of a heterosexual relationship to mirror a displaced homoerotic relationship, Joan of Arc uses a feminine trait of passivity and self-sacrifice to place herself in a position of power which grants her proximity to God. Therefore, the point is not to become masculine, but to blend this masculinity with femininity to achieve something godly. As Martha Vicinus explains, Victorian women believed profoundly that love came from God, and then it had to be honored as his gift. Women who loved women saw no division between their love and their love of God. The liberties and sanctions of the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church both enabled and constrained the expression of earthly same-sex love. Love, including same-sex love, is then considered as almost a religious element. Therefore, acting upon homoerotic, romantic, and social desires was acceptable within the spiritual realm. Joan of Arc becomes thus a symbol of homoeroticism for the woman who purchased the watercolor and further validates the idea of religion and of operating within religious boundaries as a path to more freely navigate in potentially oppressing dynamics. As a result, and similar to the women's adoption of religious practices and elements to enter and engage in paternal practices, the women's identification with Christ-like figures enables them to display their agency. It is thus their passivity in accepting and adhering to social and religious practices that allows them to act upon their focus on female collectives. To briefly conclude, I hope the examples discussed today demonstrate that the religious symbolism in early Pre-Raphaelite works allowed for women to feel proximity to these works and to display their own agency, artistic identity, and interpersonal desires within a socially accepted realm. Similar to the religious sisterhoods formed during the same period, acting upon religious motivations more than a symbol of social constraints can be seen as a way for women to more freely exhibit their subjectivity. With their devotion-enabled practices, they are thus able to perform their homosocial and homoerotic desires, therefore forming a shared artistic identity that disrupts normative patterns through a collective commitment to the celebration of female agency. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katia, for that. Um, I, you're getting a bit of a um, digital round of applause, which is fantastic, thank you. Um, so we're going to open up the floor to questions. I have enabled the chat and participants should be able to now turn their cameras on and if you would like to ask a question I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself. 
you can write just the word question in the chat box or you can write out your question and I can read it out for you um, either way. So before um, we open up the floor and just to give people a chance to gather their thoughts, um, Katia, I just wanted to ask about, um, I was very interested in how you covered women as collectors, but also women as critics as well. And I wanted to ask about the published criticism of some of the women in this circle and how that was received in relation to maybe the, the published art criticism of more prominent male members of the pre circle or the circle around the pre um, and if, if it was received in the same way um, uh, and sort of how, to what extent were women engaging with art through the practice of publishing art criticism? Sorry, my internet is a bit slow. I think so. We've got back? you back okay. now. Yeah. <laughs> did did yeah. you get that question? Did you? I hear think it? so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, about these women in specific. So Lady Paul Intervallian wrote not only this um, um, pamphlet or, or response to Ruskin's pamphlet, but also other pieces of art criticism, uh, which I think due to her gender, as most practices during the time, became a bit buried, so they don't they didn't get the same attention um, as the 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 writings of their male peers. Um, but still, she 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 was a very successful and informed um, patron, and that really transpires in some of her writings. But they also didn't become too. Uh, known and what I find um, not just with the writers but also with the patrons is that similar to um, how women artists, especially women who are from an aristocratic or upper class um, background, um, there was the idea that they shouldn't 